we will now proceed to the second speaker in this session. Thank you, Dr. Papa. Our second speaker is Dr. Marilyn Parungao Balolong. Dr. Balolong is currently a professor of microbiology at the Department of Biology and a university scientist uh, of the College of Arts and Sciences, University of the Philippines, Manila. She is also a diplomate of the Philippine Academy for Microbiology, and she was trained as a microbiologist since 1993, starting in UP Los Baños. And in UP Manila, she obtained her Doctor of Public Health a degree in medical microbiology in 2015. She has been doing research for almost 25 years now, and she heads the Applied Microbiology for Health and Environment Research Group, advocating for One Health and Planetary Health. This is a research group at UP Manila, which aims to address issues concerning health and environment through applied microbiology and molecular biology research approaches. So I will now give the screen to Dr. Balolong for her talk on resistomes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Les, for that uh, introduction. Good morning, everyone. First, of course, allow me to thank the organizers, Paase, for giving us the opportunity to share some updates about our work and about the discipline where we belong to. Also, my greetings uh, are going out to the participants catching us via the live stream and via Zoom. So today, my talk will revolve on the evolving value of analyzing resistomes from culture plates to whole genomes. Next slide, please. So before the availability of the first broadly useful antibiotics, life expectancy was much shorter and infectious diseases were the dominant causes of death. Uh, antibiotics helped to reduce mortality that were not previously treatable. However, Fleming, who discovered penicillin himself, in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech warned of the emergence or possible emergence of antibiotic resistance. So while the development of resistance is a natural phenomenon, overuse, and inappropriate use of antimicrobials are important factors in rapidly exacerbating the problem. Today, there exists resistance to almost every antibiotic that we use. Next slide, please. So the genetic and functional diversity in the resistome is vast and actually it reflects the billions of years of evolution of microorganisms in close contact with toxic molecules of, mo of several origins. Phenotypic resistance can be acquired through growth in biofilms, for instance, swarming adaptation, or development of persisters, among others. But there is intrinsic resistance, no? So the intrinsic resistance here will include mechanism that have evolved as a general response to toxic molecules. These are SOS response or the production of beta lactamases or even the barriers such as your porins or the outer covering of gram negative bacteria or outer membrane, I would say. Also, there's acquired resistance. No? So this comprises mechanisms that, that evolve. Uh, actually, these are countermeasures to particular antibiotics or scaffolds which are often through horizontal gene transfer. Next slide, please. So recent research points to the environment as an essential factor in the spread of AMR, as well as a possible reservoir of antimicrobial resistant bacteria and even AR genes. So this will include your soil, your water, your air, or even your built environments. Wild and domestic animals are also sources of resistance genes. And uh, microbial species that are shared with humans, including many that cause diseases. So shown here are the possible interactions and transmission pathways between agriculture, humans, and the environment, and also including wildlife. 
So because the environment plays a multiple role in the spread and storage of AMR genes, more research is indeed needed. So how do we study AMR and eventually the resistomes? Next slide, please. Culture-based studies provide an important link between antibiotic resistance that is measured in the environment and antibiotic resistance detected in human clinical or environmental isolates. The advantage of culture-based studies is its low cost and, of course, the potential in combining it with other methodologies. The disadvantage, however, is that it provides a highly restricted view of microbial community structure for studies of environmental microorganisms if you're using environmental samples. So routine antibiogram techniques are also based on phenotypic study. But nowadays, recent high throughput and automated methods increase the processing capabilities, data production, and of course, the analysis, even if culture-based techniques are used. So to date also, a variety of molecular approaches have also been applied to study AMRs. Let us check them out in the next slide. Next slide, please. So we call them the culture-independent methods. No? So they are used to identify the diversity and activity of microorganisms in environmental samples, and they can be divided into two groups or two categories. First, the partial community analysis approaches. This will include your DGGE, your DNA microarrays, your RT-PCR, or your fluorescence in situ hybridization. The other category is the whole community analysis approaches. This now includes your whole genome sequencing or the sequence-based metagenomics and all the downstream omics that are um, being popular right now. In my opinion, the combination of both culturomics or the culture base and metagenomics approaches will significantly advance our understanding of the role of microorganisms and their specific properties. So in terms of studying environmental resistomes, what information are currently available right now? What are the gaps? And what can still be done? Next slide, please. So let's start uh, about an update on soil as an environmental resistome. Manure, which contains large amount of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance genes, is widely used in agricultural soils and may lead to the evolution and dispersal of ARGs in the soil environment. If you, if you would take a look at this figure, this is from uh, a recent uh, published report by Wang and colleagues, they found out that long-term manure application markedly increased the relative abundance and the detectable numbers of ARGs. Interestingly, long-term effects of chemical fertilizers only moderately affected the diversity of ARGs and had no significant effect on the relative abundance of the total ARGs. This provides insight into the long-term effects of manure or even chemical fertilization on the dissemination of AR genes in intensive agricultural system. So in the country, here in the Philippines, this is also a good avenue to provide evidence-based research data that would influence policy on how to effectively improve organic farming in view of AMR transmission to our local produce. Next slide, please. Next would be the air as an environmental resistome. This would also include our built environments. So healthcare associated infections or uh, these uh, bacteria associated with healthcare or hospital settings contribute to a major public health issue by increasing patient morbidity and mortality during or even after their hospital stay. In this figure, Christoph and colleagues performed a one-year cross-sectional profiling of bacteria and AMR genes in adult and neonatal intensive care units. So ICU versus the NICU. Uh, oh, <laughs> apologies for this rather blurry figure. <laughs> I never realized it was an eyesore. So anyway, I'll just tell you the summary of this figure. So uh, they found out that in every 1.6% of environmental samples, 
and 9.9% of patient samples, more than one resistance gene was detected. NICU, uh, environment and patients uh, were more widely contaminated with pathogenic bacteria compared to the ICU. And the patient samples, despite the higher bacterial load, have lower bacterial diversity than the environmental samples in both units. Identified contamination hotspots in the hospital environment showing constant frequencies of bacterial and AMR contamination was also observed throughout the year. So what is the benefit if we study environmental resistome in healthcare settings? Of course, large-scale monitoring of hospital microbial contamination would be possible. So if we have this particular information, healthcare institutions can improve their infection control practices. Also, effective identification of healthcare-associated infection hotspots and contamination flow tracing. So this represents an unprecedented resolution gain for hospital microbiological control and epidemiological surveillance. Next slide, please. Let's move on to water as an environmental resistome. Particularly, I'm focusing on WWTP or wastewater treatment plant. So like soils, your aquatic environment, such as your rivers, your lakes, marine systems, uh, sewage, no? they, uh, they contain microorganisms and, and they act as reservoirs of resistance, uh, resistant organisms or even the resistant genes. No? So Ju and colleagues in this particular slide proposed this hypothesis on how resistomes can be affected by the processes going on inside the water, uh, wastewater treatment plant. Antibiotics in WWTP may act as drivers on micro, in a microbial community and resistomes. No? So for instance, in an activated sludge process, we can expect changes in biomass per volume. But we can also see or observe of your ARG carrying bacteria. So we can also expect a strong shift no, in the composition of the microbial community as a whole. And uh, of course, also including will be the antibiotic resistant subset. So these changes are expected to correlate to shifts of the resistome, which are viewed as contigs in the figure. No? They are carrying the different uh, AR genes. So they have noted two possible origins of uh, AR bacteria or AR genes that are discharged with the effluent. So they say that some may have passed through the entire treatment plant if the bacteria will survive treatment. Another source would be they originate from populations of bacteria that are originally growing in the wastewater treatment plant. Lastly, resistance plasmids arriving with human pathogens or commensals in the inflow could eventually become established also in the treatment plan. Having said that, it would be interesting to study WWTP resistomes as it can impact human health in general, right? So let me give you a clearer perspective in the next slide. Next slide, please. In this study, uh, next, yes, thank you. Uh, in this study by Yin and colleagues, they comprehensively quantified the antibiotic resistance genes and identified the host microbiome in a Hong Kong WWTP in a span of nine years. They have shown here that both the abundance and the structure of the resistome change significantly every two to three years. This implies that there is a successive selection of resistomes in the activated sludge system over the study period. Here are some important key findings. They have, uh, uh, they have uh, concluded that the WWTP acts as reservoirs of AR genes since they have detected genes from MRSA or, and other important pathogens. They also identified a core resistome no, in activated sludge, and they found that these overlap with those in other ecosystems such as urban sewage, livestock feces, fish pond sediments, 
and it reveals a broad dissemination of AR genes from the WWTP going on to the environment. So based on these findings, longitudinal monitoring of our WWTP is warranted for risk assessment to reveal emerging AR genes or evolution of resistomes, correlation of uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and the potential spread in downstream environments and concomitant exposure risk for humans. So if this is the case for the WWTP, how about drinking, drinking water reservoir? Let us find out in the next slide. So reservoirs, I have mentioned earlier, play a vital role in the control and management of surface water resources. However, the long water residence time in the reservoir can potentially increase the storage and accumulation of antibiotic resistance genes. So this is a recent study by Dang and colleagues, and they have showed the overall ARG abundance in the sediment was higher than that in water. No? They also seen that bacitracin and vancomycin resistance genes were the predominant ARG types in the water and the sediment respectively. So they also pointed out that potential public health risks posed by resistomes in reservoir were higher in the dry season than in the wet season because the overall ARG abundance in the dry season was higher than that in the wet season. So having said this, we should have strategies no, that would include sediment control and pathogen monitoring suggested for water safety management in drinking water, water reservoirs, right? So it is time to provide evidence for the Philippines, perhaps, because there are no data available yet. Next slide, please. I think this is my last slide. Okay, so lastly, on behalf of my research group, the Amherst UP Manila, we thank you for this opportunity. So the team has so far contributed to genotyping ESBLs in the healthcare setting. Uh, and also we have uh, earlier managed to conduct a combined uh, culturomics and metagenomics approach to limited the profiling of environmental AR bacteria and ARGs from WWTP to Manila Bay. But there's quite a lot of work to do still. No? So currently we are geared up. But of course, we would love to have collaborators for the following initiative, no? for the agri-food systems and environment systems, also for the port and ballast water systems, as well as expansion of our WWTP systems research. Uh, we aim for products, we aim for patents, and hopefully our evidence generated from these uh, collaborations will influence policy uh, in the future. So hope this serves as an invitation for future collaboration. Again, thank you, Paase, for this opportunity. Thank you for listening, and thank you. I will be uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Balolong, for that very interesting talk. So uh, we will have uh, more questions for you in the uh, open forum later after the third talk. But just a quick question for now. Uh, do you think uh, the Philippines has now the capacity to do resistome research? Uh, that would be very uh, uh, interesting uh, to know, right, Dr. Les? Actually, uh, uh, now we have the Philippine Genome Center. And I think uh, there are several laboratories now that are being equipped no, uh, with the capability of at least a PCR and a qPCR system no so we are now uh, advanced in a way so I think no I think uh, we have the capacity but we are willing to train anyone or any laboratory that would be very interested uh, I think also uh, the, the benefits uh, for now is that the sequencing uh, fees are uh, getting lower and lower compared to uh, a few years ago, like say five or ten years ago. So I think it's time. No? I think it's time that the Philippines, the Philippines, would be venturing in this kind of uh, research, Doctor Les. Thank you, Doctor Balolong. We'll get back to you later.